Okay. Yes. And we're hap. And we're hap. Okay. Funny. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if you're like me, and I know I am, uh, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film, because, I mean, who is it? This podcast, it's sweeping the nation. It's Swiffer wet jetting the nation. Yes. But only the real fans, the true hardcore fans who have been with us since day one, only they would know uh, the two main facts about the both of us, the two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest will they or won't they podcasting couple, Bunny and Maylin. The first and foremost, Bunny, is the fact that when you're not doing the podcast, you travel around uh, local coffee shops in Chicago and you're a, f a fairly celebrated local acoustic folk singer you sing about the plight of the people without a voice uh bunny yes. tell us a little bit about your music uh it is it, it it's very it is very aggressive it is all all acoustic i have mastered the ability to play the spaghetti pot uh so I will just go into the coffee shop holding a giant spaghetti pot and I will use that as my instrument and it is all acoustic. Who the fuck plugs in a spaghetti pot? Okay. Good point. Good point. Nobody. Nobody. Uh that's gonna be that's gonna be what's on our new t shirt at our merch store. Yes. And and I I sing songs uh that are relevant to relevant and important to today's society uh because i, I want to shape the world i want to give back to the world uh you know so um the ballad of dr seuss is a big one uh yeah mr potato head's balls is 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 Mr. Potato Head's balls are always a crowd pleaser. Yes. Nice. That's huge. Nice. Yes. Uh so so that is that is it. Uh, uh I I have a song about whacking off to the green M&M. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh that's Polk. Yeah. Punk folk is polk. Oh, punk folk song. Okay. No. Uh, polk with an A. Yes. Is polka. I, 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 yeah. Yes, I thought. Yeah. And, and the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So this is what we do at this part of the podcast. We uh, get a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know that well. And uh, I reword it via my own unique storytelling style, my razzmatazz, my ha-cha-cha. -cha. And that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of historic approximations, or as we like to call it, Me the dramatic music, Bunny. Dun dun dun! You you were you were too far away from the microphone, so I didn't actually hear you say anything back there. Oh, I was I tried to yell "hap." I wasn't sure if if people could hear. I don't want to yell right into the microphone. Now that's capital H, capital A, small P. Um, this segment needs uh, small P's to its name. OK, yes. we need that. That's that small P is vital to the essential ebb and flow of the entire broadcast spectrum. Bunny, listen, hit bunny, hit the bars, work some parties and get me some P. I need P. 
<laughs> Eddie, what kind of a podcast segment is this? Now, this segment was formerly known as Steve's Historic Approximations, or SHAP, as we like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wanted us to or not. Uh, that was the segment's original name. However, a dead name is a dead name for a reason. And so we're moving on. Well, Bunny, what's happening on HAP this week? It is the much anticipated second half of a two part HAP. Last episode, we were going to simply discuss the origins of the original King Kong movie and the mess surrounding the remake in the 70s and ha have is having a small focus on the King Kong protests that happened uh, because the Empire State Building employees were upset. Yes. Because in the 70s remake, King Kong climbs up the World Trade Center, which is a smart move because unlike the Empire State Building, the World Trade Center is going to be there forever. Yeah. So um very excited so yes so but, however uh while doing the research for that i uh, i uncovered a crazy 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 story um oh do 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 do, do. and then i couldn't find the picture last week that upset me so much i was looking for a picture but i couldn't find it it was the whole thing go listen to the podcast episode 447 blood beat strange ass film very glowing yes i low-key loved it but in the research for that for last episode's historic approximations i discovered that the original 1930s king kong movie was secretly based on a controversial fake documentary that hardly anyone remembers in our modern day and this my friends is that story it's the story of the country's first fake documentary its success and its scandals which may or may not have involved the united states government uh-huh yes this is the true story of king kong's estranged father the 1930 film in Goggy. Okay, put up picture A. First one. Did you do it? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh In Goggy, also known as In Goggy Gorilla, also known as In Goggy the Wonder Film, also known as In Goggy the Greatest Movie Hoax. And later, we're also going to be uh, doing a uh, little postscript about uh, people. Uh, there's going to be... Uh, we're also going to talk about the film's number of sequels. One was truly historic, but we'll get there. So buckle up, kiddos, because it's a four-hour drive to Douglas, and we're not stopping anywhere until we get to Tucson, but we will stop at the Stuckies if you're good, bunny. Yeah. If you behave back there. Okay. 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 Uh, today during the podcast, I will be <coughs> drinking the all new Starry Lemon Line Soda. Not a sponsor. I love this stuff. <coughs> Hi, Max. I went outside. Nice. You went outside? You've been outside? Awesome. Okay. Uh, so, in order to talk about this notorious film, In Goggy, the Wonder Film, we need to talk about a whole gang of weirdos. There's Willie, the producer, age question mark. There's Selig, the conjurer and his bizarre zoo. And there's Charlie, the Filipino with the suit. It's a whole rogues gallery of weirdos for this particular story. But to start off with, uh, let's run away from home, Bunny. You and me are going to run away from home, okay? Okay. Okay. But not like modern day run away from home. Not like, uh, oh, I'm going to have, I'm going to get a Uber uh, on my app. We're not, we're not just going to go to Toronto and crash at Bowers Place. I'm talking Bindle on a stick. 
Ten minute warning. Cool. Hopping on a freight train, sort of running away. Learning hobo code. Yes. That sort of old school running away. We're all going to be around a trash can with one can of beans. Because the eventual director of Ingagi was a mousy little guy named Billy Campbell. He was born in 1884 in Ashley, Pennsylvania, a one-time coal mining town, and now it's barely a town. According to the U.S. Census, the town, with liberal finger quotes, has a total area of 0 0.9 square miles. That's a small town, Bunny. Yes, it is. It's barely anything. It's a zit on the butt of the great state of Pennsylvania. So I was going to look up some information about the town of Ashley, Pennsylvania, and I couldn't find anything. So I looked up. In well, let me look up information for Pennsylvania. Do you know what the state bird is, Bunny, for Pennsylvania? Uh, the vulture. No, but you said that with the confidence of a man who knew. Yeah, I and I appreciated that. that. The state bird of Pennsylvania is the ruffed grouse. The ruffed grouse. Okay. Yes. So let me tell you about the ruffed grouse. Uh, put up picture B. It's a pic That's a ruffed grouse, Bunny. Is that what that is? <laughs> yeah, it's a ruffed grouse. I like the picture because doesn't he look like a dappy little Dan? Yes, he does. There aren't too many birds that I could accurately uh, describe as little Lord Fauntleroy. Yes. But that's the rough grouse right there. It is apparently the most wildly distributed game bird in all of North America. The thing I love about the rough grouse is that it sounds like a crappy name J.K. Rowling would give to a wizard. Yes. Oi, my name's Ruff Grouse. Welcome to the squiggling ocelot. What can I get you today? That's 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 my new character, Ruff Grouse. Ruff Grouse. Ruff Grouse. Yes. He, I, freaking J.K. Rowling. Um. Hey, I've I've I've. I've got an idea. I'm going to make a, um, an Asian character in the school. I'm going to name her Cho Chang. Yeah. Dang, J.K. Rowling. Dang. And then I saw this tweet that was so great where, or maybe it was a meme where it's like um, Tolkien bases a race of, of, uh, of, of, people in one of his fantasy books on Jewish people and he makes them proud of their heritage and they're scattered all over the place as, in, as if in a diaspora but they are proud of their heritage and proud of their race and they're hard workers and they're industrious and J.K. Rowling said what if we make the goblins with hook noses that work in banks <laughs> freaking J.K. Rowling so Billy C. Billy C. was born in a nothing town in the 1880s, and he wants excitement, <clears throat> adventure, some third thing. So one day the circus comes to town. Dude runs away with the circus, which in the early 1900s was a viable career path. Yes. Back then. It's like, oh, it's a career day at school. And then it, there's just there's just one guy who's there to get kids into clowning. So Billy is growing up in the circus world. And let's say that at first they're all, Hey, new kid, go clean up the animal crap. And Billy's just happy to not be in Ashley, Pennsylvania. I'm happy to not be in Ashley, Pennsylvania. Bunny, are you happy to not be in Ashley, Pennsylvania? Oh, fucking God. Yes. I don't even think they have a Walmart. I don't even think they have a Walmart. Well, so that, that, Billy would, C that goes, would be a plus. 
But they they, uh, they clearly do not have. Uh, okay, they have a hooker, but you don't want to go there. <laughs> they don't have a Dairy Queen. They have a taste because all freeze. of Ashley has sucking on a chili dog. <laughs> uh, so where was I? Okay, so he goes from shoveling animal crap to dealing with the animals to handling the animals, and eventually he becomes adept at animal wrangling. So eventually, Billy C. leaves the circus. He opens up a movie theater because Billy wants to get into the motion picture business. And it is here that Billy Campbell has a Marvel Comics team up with the first member of this rogues gallery of weirdos that created the first uh mockumentary and that is William Selig and uh maybe that's a good place to leave it for now because we do this on Zoom and our 40 minutes are almost up and uh this is a good place for me to remember where I left off in my notes okay so uh so we record this on Zoom so we're going to take a short break and uh, we will be right back with the rest of the story of the making of Ngangi. Uh, there won't be any more stuff about the roughed grouse, though. But we're going to keep it up because it, it doesn't it look like a pretty boy. It, it looks like uh, if someone made John Oliver into a bird for real. Yes. James, it gives off a James Corden vibe. <laughs> it looks like he has treated some waiters like crap before. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna take a break for just a second and we will right be right back with more historic approximations. Hey guy. <laughs> I think Social Security should be uh, privatized. You can't go to a supermarket without being accosted by a homeless guy. Democrats and liberals attack viciously. I will take over store time. Not if I have anything to say about it, Skeletor. We will fight to the death. Or, gentlemen, may I suggest a second option? What if we all enjoy the great taste of sugar crisp? Can't get enough of that sugar crisp, sugar crisp, sugar crisp. And we're back with the friend, our friend, the grouse. Yes, the rough, the roughed grouse. The roughed Oi! grouse. I'm the roughed grouse. I is. Welcome to Hogsmeade. Uh, so. Uh, Billy Campbell ran off to join the circus. Now he owns a movie theater and he's teaming up with a man with a crazy name. William Selig is his name. He went by a lot of other names in his lifetime, including W.N. Selig, Colonel Selig, and Selig the Conjurer. Oh. Because Selig was Selig was born to Polish immigrants in Chicago in the 1860s, so he was older than Billy. And he, uh, Selig also ran off and joined the circus as a teenager. So Billy Campbell and Selig the Conjurer, uh, both uh, carnies, similar backgrounds. Selig was a fake conjurer, a fake professor. 
He started a traveling band. He had his hand in everything. Uh, he left the circus. He sold furniture. He was always trying for his next big uh, gimmick, money-making, uh, who's he, what's it. Then in 1894, at the Texas State Fair, Selig is looking for his next big uh, thing. And he sees some of Edison's employees doing a demo of the kinetoscope. Ooh, ah, some third noise. Uh, so Selig is thinking, how can I make movies without paying Edison any damn money? Because Edison is crazy. I, did you hear? He electrocuted an elephant. And yes. there's a whole Bob's Burgers episode about it. So, uh, so this slick uh, a hole, uh, uh, Selig the Conjurer, he tracks down a guy. He's like a pipe fitter, a welder, an electrician. He works with metals. He. The Lumiere brothers once hired him to fix a film camera. And uh, Selig the Conqueror finds this guy and says, okay, here's a crap ton of money. Tell me what's inside of it. Tell me how to make it. We're going to reverse engineer us a camera. Okay. So Edison was like, hey, I've created the kinetoscope. Now you can make moving pictures. So if you want to make movies, I'm the only person in town. Pay me a bajillion dollars. And it was William Selig that said, I'm going to figure out how to make this and make it cheap in a way where everyone can afford it to bypass Edison. In a way, this guy accidentally created Hollywood. But William Selig, with the uh, employee's help, Selig the Conjurer reverse engineers one of the first non-Edison film cameras, and he uses that to start the Selig Polyscope Company, which was one of the first motion picture studios in the United States. Selig the Conjurer, a freaking carny, fake colonel, fake conjurer, wannabe Tom Parker mofo, inadvertently helps create Hollywood. Hey. Can you believe that? So Selig the Conjurer meets Billy C because Billy C owns a movie theater, and See, Selig that, hires that is, Billy. C. That is it, though. That is literally so Hollywood, where you, you just always fail up. Yeah, yeah, fail a uh, task failed successfully. Yeah. yeah. So Selig hires Billy C. to write scripts for him. Originally, Selig's picture studio, because pictures weren't a thing, so Selig's studio would just shoot news and travelogues and documentary sort of shiznittle. But The Conjurer wants to get into fiction. For Selig, Billy C. wrote a film called How the Cause Was Won which some people call the first war drama ever on film. So for Selig the Conjurer, Billy C. made one of the first war movies ever made. So Selig the Conjurer gives Billy C. his first big break, and soon Billy Campbell has moved on to other studios. He's working for Max Senate. He's working for Keystone. He's working for Universal. And he starts using his circus background. Billy makes a bit of a name for himself making animal comedies. Okay, put up picture six so that we can all see a mousy little uh, Billy Campbell. This is Billy Campbell. Billy was a circus kid. He knew how to handle animals. He becomes one of the name in animal comedies. He becomes a name, writing, directing, producing. He did a bunch of uh, Our Gang knockoffs. Uh, in 1992... What the hell would be an Our, game, our Gang knockoff? I, I, I don't know, but like... Uh, I don't know. I would like to think that uh, the 
the raps yeah, in these streets but, and, and were it just also a, it also sounds like it should really really exist but i have never heard of one yeah oh, not where me. are those movies? yeah in 1922 yeah. The, in 1922, the newspapers claimed Willie, well, and this is a quote, William S. Campbell has directed nearly all the famous monkeys that have appeared in movies in the past six years. Fun side note, Billy C. got divorced in 1926. The wife said in court, quote, he spends more time with animals than with me. That is a boss ass answer. Yeah. That is awesome. So, it's 1925, and Billy C., the animal director, gets an idea for a movie. An idea so crazy, so wild, so some third thing, uh, I have lost my spot, that no one has ever thought of this before. Okay, I have a movie idea. Hear me out. Okay. Wild and crazy idea. No one's ever done this, but just hear me out, okay? What if we, hear me out, made a documentary that was real. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Uh, documentaries are real. You can't make, you can't just make a fake one. What would that even be? A mockumentary? No one would ever pay to see one of those. Not even if in the future, Fred Willard is born. Yes. But Billy C wants to make a documentary. We could just fake it and we'll pass it off as real. <coughs> uh, we'll make a few bucks. Boom. And that first mockumentary that tried to pass itself off as a normal documentary was the racist ass 1930 film in Gaggi. Now switch it to D. Uh, look at poster that is some that is some racist forgive my french yeah. that is some racist mierd <laughs> is that how you say shit in french i think so how do you say shit in french no. you're in a french class they don't teach how to cuss in high school french man our tax dollars at work. Okay, fine. But, uh, so this is some, uh, uh, uh racist, uh, shit here. But this so, movie. So what, so, what happens if you're stuck in France and you have to call somebody a cock gobbler? Are you going to be prepared? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Because it happens. I know. Huh? I know Shiza. Yeah. Wrong country. Yeah. Wrong country, though. Kids, have you ever wondered why King Kong, a 100-foot gorilla, somehow inexplicably wants to do it with a 5-foot-tall white model? The reason is this crappy, racist, fake documentary that made millions of dollars in the 1930s, that's not adjusted for inflation. Ngagi made what historians uh, estimate to be roughly $4 million in 1930 money. Adjusted for inflation, that comes out to, hold on, uh, hacking into the mainframe, carry the two, a shit ton. Yes would be how much that would be now. So here is the plot of Ngagi. It's a documentary about the real-life British adventurer, Sir Hubert Winstead and his team as they travel deep into the African jungle to witness a very rare tribal ritual that no white man has ever seen and lived. <laughs> where the natives sacrifice their own women to large gorillas to spare the rest of the tribe. Huh, huh, huh. Gee, that sure does sound familiar, doesn't it? Huh, I'm having some sort of a deja vu moment. Maybe there's a glitch in the Matrix. Hmm, I wonder where I have heard that before. 
huh, sacrificing women to a giant ape. Uh, crazy enough, that's something George Santos claimed oh, on yes. the campaign trail. It's weird. It's weird. Uh, uh, where in the world was I? Uh, yes. Oh, oh, here's, here's some proof. Okay. I found this according to YouTube. Thank you. Approximately 41 minutes into Ngagi, a wild rhinoceros charges directly at the camera and it quickly jump cuts to a shot of a hunter firing at the camera. And three years later, approximately 18 minutes into RKO's King Kong, filmmaker Carl Denham 100% describes the exact same scene. Yeah. I'm just saying. Uh, Ingagi is a fake documentary that they try to pass as a real one, and it was such a success that RKO is a very well done and masterful, groundbreaking ripoff of a racist <coughs> fake documentary. That is fucked up. And that, kids and kiddos, is why King Kong is always horny on Maine for tiny chicks. It's yeah. all in Goggy, bunny. All roads all lead sense. to in Goggy. It all makes sense. I need to have a, a pin tax on the back of my uh, wall with a bunch of string and Pepe Silvia, Pepe Silvia. So to make in Goggy, Billy C gets a team of people to help him. There's the producer. Oh, his name was Willie, a.k.a. William Alexander. He was an African-American. He was a black man who somehow had the balls to produce one of the most racist films in existence. Now, here's the odd thing. I'm going to tell you what the odd thing is. And then regardless of whether it's probable, I'm going to continue with that which is in the history books. Hear me out. Um, William D. Alexander was born in Denver in 1916. He's a local boy, Bunny. Yeah. And he had a hand in the movie business, and he is listed as one of the main executive producers of Ngagi. But... But... If you do the math on that, did you notice when I said he was born in 1916? If you do the math, then he produced Ngagi when he would have been 14 years old. Yeah. That's that not working. That can't be right. A 14-year-old black kid from Chicago, a teenager, becoming an executive producer of one of the highest grossing movies in America during one of the worst, most racist times in history? The math doesn't check out. But... This is what the history book said. A 14-year-old teen, a black teen named Willie, was the executive producer. I don't believe that any black person would ever finance this racist story of uh, uh, African bestiality, uh, let alone B, that said person would be in high school. But there it is, Billy C. and his teenage director. This is just what's in the history book. And I'm just letting you know. Uh, so there's Billy C, the director. There's Willie, the money man. But wait, we're going to need a gorilla suit. You should say that about every aspect of your life. I, think uh, so. I have to I have to go to work. I need to get coffee, uh, pick up my laundry. We're going to need a gorilla suit. Everything is better in a gorilla suit. Oh, man, I am late for church. And I'm gonna need a gorilla suit. Man. I, it is very difficult being a doctor, being a decorated surgeon. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. I'm gonna have to go into this next room and tell that young pregnant woman that her husband is dead. Nurse, get me a gorilla suit, stat! 
Everything is better with a gorilla suit. Yes. So, I mean, this is how we're going to movie. Uh, we're going to we're going to movie the movie. So, uh, yeah, we can get some stock footage. We can shove that in there, get some stock footage, just some animals. We can steal some scenes from other films if we need to. Repeat for dramatic emphasis in uh, parentheses. We can put stock footage in there and we can steal scenes from other films, too, to pad out the film. That might be important. I repeated that. That might be important later. Yes. But we need a gorilla suit for some of the scenes. Well, in the 1920s and 1930s, if you needed a gorilla suit, you called one man. And that man was Charles Gamora, a.k.a. Carlos Cruz Gamora, a.k.a. Charlie the Filipino, who happens to own a gorilla costume. Because back in the early days, and I think this is something that we've talked about on the podcast, maybe something you've mentioned before, Bunny, but sometimes to become famous in Hollywood or to get a part in a movie, all you need is to be the guy who owns a gorilla suit. Oh, God, yes. There have been so many movies where, well, that was the guy who owns a gorilla suit. So many times. And so, then they would, they would just hire you in the suit because you had the suit. Yeah. So we have, yeah. I can't think of any offhand, but we had a few famous gorilla suit actors. And probably one of the famous, most famous one is Charlie the Filipino with a suit, a.k.a. Carlos Cruz Gamora. But, uh, yeah, he was the Filipino with a suit. He did a ton of gorilla parts in movies, but he was usually not credited. And here is why. Back then, Hollywood was still trying to, uh, to use wrestling parlance. They were still trying to keep Hollywood kayfabe. So they would want people to be tricked into thinking that the guy in the gorilla costume was a real gorilla. And oftentimes they would even hire these people and swear them to secrecy about being a guy in a gorilla costume. So, okay, we've got we're starting to get a team here. There's Billy C, the Carney director. There's Willie, the teenage money man. There's Charlie, the Filipino with the gorilla suit. But wait, where will we film this movie? L.A. isn't exactly the jungles of Africa. Well, that is when Billy C. says, don't worry, I know a guy. Beep, boop, pop, boop. Oh, wait, this is like the 19, this is like 1929, so. You know, you're still not far back enough. Going back there, you would have to turn the crank on the side of the phone. Oh, yeah, nice. And then ask for the operator. My bell. Give me Klondike five. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So uh, he calls somebody up. Uh, hey, Selig, I need a favor. Yeah, you remember Selig the Conjurer, the guy who accidentally created Hollywood? Uh, that huckster's back. Uh, because within his film studio, this nut job, this mad lad, built a zoo not for people it was a zoo that was specifically built via hollywood razzmatazz it was built to look like a friggin jungle so if you were making a safari pick you were making a jungle picture you're making a new tarzan film uh you called selig the conjurer and for a price, he'd let you shoot in his fake L.A. jungle zoo. So they get Selig the Conqueror That's, to use you know, his... as long as he had one. Yeah. So uh, uh, they make this racist-ass fake documentary about African women who are sex slaves to giant apes in a ritual. Uh... And I had to add this story 
Uh, can you switch it to picture F? The most important F? Oh, did we not do it to E? We never made it to E. Okay, do it to E. Okay, it's the guy with the gorilla, yeah? Yeah. Okay, that's Charlie the Filipino who owns a gorilla costume. He did most of the, a bunch of the gorilla pictures. And there he is with, uh, doesn't he look like he would be in one of those uh, Bowery Boy movies? He does. He does. He looks like uh, one of the hell's a poppin' boys. Yeah. You know? Uh, so uh, that's uh, Charlie, the Filipino, who happened to own a gorilla costume. He will be playing some of the gorilla parts. So now let's move it to F. The most important picture of this entire story. Oh, look at that picture. Look at its beauty, its majesty. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. It is a perfect boy. So in the film, Sir Hubert Winstead manages to capture footage of a new animal heretofore undiscovered in the history books. A new animal he discovers in the journey. This picture right here is it. Sir Hubert dubs this new creature, pause for dramatic effect, the Tortadillo. And here's the thing. That is real. Do you see that, Bunny? That is real. Okay. In that, it's, so a, it's a real a fucking camera. turtle. It's a real turtle that they glued wings and scales to. And a tail. So, this movie is not only racist, but it's also mad animal cruelty, dog. <laughs> they also show a lot of, like, animals getting slaughtered in tribal ceremonies. Apocalypse Now style. Yeah. Pork lips now. Anywho, I love the Tortadillo. Look at that cute little guy. Oh, look at you. Look at you, little Tortadillo. If I go right here, I can, I can feed him. Here, here you go. Here's a little Tortadillo treat. There you go. That was nice. I, uh, hashtag Tortadillo. If you're a fan of Tortadillo... Shout out hashtag Tortadillo in the comments. Uh, I'm all about the Tortadillo. It could so be a Pokemon. Yes. Now, now, seriously, run over here. Run over here. Come 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 here. This is a fake. This is a fake creature that appeared in this fake racist ass documentary. It's called a Tortadillo. Yeah. Can you see that as a Pokemon? It's tail, the wings. But it's also like a freaking turtle. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm really excited. It's a new flying type. It's a flying rock type. What? Mind blown. Yeah. That's my new he, he and it and it flies in the air. Tortadillo, go! Use razor tail. Tordo, Tordo, Tordo. That's the oh, noise that's, that it that's makes. That's its Gamera heritage. Yeah. Of course Hashtag it would tortadillo. have to fly. Yeah. So uh, the gang is all together. We got the director, the teen producer, the guy with the suit, Selig the Conjurer, his weird-ass zoo. They form a production company that they call Congo Pictures, and they make in Kagi, but they are so freaking broke they're 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 struggling to make this film they're cutting corners left and right uh there's one scene where a lion jumps right at the camera and uh that's a famous lion it's the mgm lion they borrowed it yeah yeah it's really weird and here's the thing uh we'll talk about this a little bit later in this uh, historic approximations. I'm really overselling this movie. It is really shitty. It's it's so bad. It's nigh unwatchable, but we'll get to that. Uh I'm just glad so that got... DMG Lim Lion got another job cuz that's the only yeah, gig right? I know of it he had. Yeah. But Congo Pictures is so broke 
which may or may not be a byproduct of having your executive producer be a teenager who's still in high school trying to pass math class, but that may or may not be true. I don't know. But Congo Pictures is so broke that they can only afford one print of the movie. One print of the whole film. So they book it in one theater in, for, in San Diego for two weeks. Uh, and over 40,000 people flock to see Ngagi in two weeks, which is a lot. Uh, uh, move on over to picture G, Bunny. Thank you. My friend who is more than brother to me. I, I embrace thee. I'm going to find that, co that cartoon that that uh, that 1960s Thor cartoon that that line is from, and I'm going <laughs> to send it to you, okay? Okay. okay I'm going to send it to you. Oh, yeah, it's the poster with the with the big boobies. Uh, racist, racist as heck. Or, uh, 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 wow, this reboot of Mannequin is, sure is different. Yes. Because she's bald like a mannequin. I liked that first film. Now Andrew, Andrew McCartney let us. himself go. Huh. So, uh, this is uh, Ngagi, a film they're advertising as 100% authentic. The most sensational picture ever filmed. Uh, this, but still, they're having a hard time. 40,000 people flock to see Ngagi, but they they're still having a hard time despite their success in San Diego, which, fun fact, I'm not sure if you know this, San Diego is actually Spanish for a whale's vagina. No major <laughs> distributor will touch this African bestiality documentary. So they, they book Ngagi's soul print on a theater-by-theater -theater tour, San Diego, L.A. for two weeks, Chicago, and then in, on April 5th, 1930, Ngagi opened at the Orpheum Theater in San Francisco, which coincidentally was owned by RKO Pictures, who looked at Ngagi and went, hmm, looks like people are really flocking to see women offered up as a sacrifice to a giant gorilla. I'll just put that in the old memory bank. <laughs> On its opening day, just on opening day, at the uh, Orpheum Theater in San Francisco, uh, it made a little under $4,000 in one theater. Uh, Ngagi was such a hit that RKO themselves ordered more prints of the film made and booked it into more RKO-owned movie theaters. It would eventually be playing in 14 theaters nationwide and make about a million dollars in 1930 money. That's not adjusted for inflation. That's crazy. Until, knock, knock, knock. Who's at the door? Ten Switch minute it warning. to picture H, Bunny. Ten minute warning. Switch it to picture eight. Who is it? It's the Hayes office. William H. Hayes, uh, uh, the, the government has sent me here. Hollywood, I am here to clean up Hollywood. Uh, it's not entirely Fatty Arbuckle's fault. All of y'all are effing horrible. But I'm <laughs> here to clean it up. I'm starting the Motion Picture Association of America, and we're going to clean up this town. So we have some questions for the makers of Ngagi. They came down hard on Ngagi, and here's the crazy part. It was not because of the racism of the film or the uh, suggested bestiality. It No, it was because, if you remember earlier, large portions of the film were stolen from other freaking movies. Okay, yeah. So the Hayes office started an investigation. The Better Business Bureau went in there and they realized, oh shit, there is no Sir Hubert Winstead. And then the American Society of Mammologists, which is apparently a real thing and not something I made up. They were like, 
Uh, yeah, we're all scientists. This is all bullshit. You know that, right? Like, apes don't bang human chicks. Plus, that's just a turtle <laughs> with <laughs> some crab glued onto it. But hey, hey, American Society of Mammologists, we, current, we now have beef. This podcast, The Pope on Film, officially is against the American Society of Mammologists because how dare you make fun of my favorite Pokemon in the world, the Tortadillo, my new baby. In fact, put yeah. the picture back up, buddy. Picture I. Put picture I back up so we can look at my new favorite baby, the Tortadillo. I'm talking about this fake uh, racist documentary, Maxwell. And the movie was fake, but they tried to pass it off as real. And so they got this creature, which is popping up now. And it's, uh, they said that it was a brand new, never before discovered creature called the Tortadillo. Doesn't that look like a Pokemon, though? Thank you. Thank you. My 11 year old agrees. This is a Pokemon. Yeah, I said that it was a flying rock type. So, yeah, it's like a hybrid. Okay. Okay. Uh, it... Sodas outside, um, and they have really cool bottle caps. Look at that. Yeah. Okay. And I have a bunch. Oh, you have a bunch of them. Okay. We're almost done, Bunny. I apologize for how long this segment is. No. Uh, I'm also crazy high, but I think I'm passing off. You're as long as I don't tell everybody. Well. Thank you. As long as I don't tell everybody that I'm really high, then everything should be fine. No one will know. It's not like we're broadcasting no one will on know. the internet or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, I want to talk some more about the Tortadillo, but uh, we're very close to finishing. Um, how about this? Why don't we uh, cut this now and we will... and. Uh, because we record this on Zoom, so we have 40-minute breaks, and uh, this is a long one, but I swear we're almost done with the story. I'm, sh I'm shocked no one has made a movie of the making of Ngagi, because this is crazy. I have a wonderful postscript at the end, too. It's going to be great. But we're going to take a short break to restart the Zoom chat, and we will be right back with the startling conclusion. To the story of Ngagi, the um, King Kong's father who went away for some smokes. Yes. And never came back. Like, seriously, you, you know King Kong as a part of your Christmas tradition. So, like, you're hearing this story and it, it clicks, doesn't it? Oh, God, yes. I always wondered why a 100-foot tall... Abe would be in love with like this chick and it's because they made this fake documentary that said in Africa they have a ritual where women are sacrificed to these apes that want to bang them and that's why King Kong to this freaking day has a thing for little chicks yeah man let's cancel King Kong I think and, and, his and father was it, mad, it is right? just so Carl Denham all over like, that is, is literally the character. Like, you can literally... There is a there is a case to be made that Ngagi is a fake film. That Ngagi is the movie Carl Denham made. Yeah. That led him to now go on this real expedition. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. But it all makes sense. This is King Kong right here. They couldn't afford uh, Rodan, so they glued some tire pieces onto a freaking turtle. I love this thing. This thing should be the new mascot of this podcast. Uh, we'll get to that. We're going to take a break. We're going to take a break. I, I'm so out of my mind. Um, we're going to take a short break, but stay with us because we will be right back in just a few seconds with the sh uh, shocking conclusion to the making of Ngagi. Here we and go. And cut. Hey, guy. I think Social Security should be pr uh, privatized. 
You can't go to a supermarket without being accosted by a homeless guy. Democrats and liberals attack viciously. I will take over store time. Not if I have anything to say about it, Skeletor. We will fight to the death. Or, gentlemen, may I suggest a second option? What if we all enjoy the great taste of sugar crisp? Can't get enough of that sugar crisp, sugar crisp, sugar crisp. And it is the tortadillo. The tortadillo, yes, my, my. My new favorite baby, my favorite Pokemon, the Tortadillo. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I grew up in the Southwest. And so since I was a little kid, I have been obsessed about jackalopes. Okay. That some huckster somewhere got a dead rabbit and stuffed it and then said, I'm going to glue antlers on it and pass it off as a real animal. And it's a fake animal but that everyone sort of wants to believe is real. Oh, God, yeah. You find them in gift shops all over here, too. Yeah, and, and you you see jackalope merch and jackalope stuff and stuffed jackalopes and all of this stuff. So if society can obsess over and manifest a jackalope into a type of existence, then I can believe with all of my trans heart of hearts that somewhere in the jungle, there exists this beautiful, beautiful baby boy. This beautiful baby. This little flying camera, the tortadillo, who can fly and is a friend to all children. Yes. So, uh, uh, hashtag tortadillo. Let's get the tortadillo trending. Uh, <laughs> where in the world was I? Hayes Code to Better Business Bureau, and then finally the FTC, or as it's pronounced, the FTC, I believe is how they pronounce that. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, steps in and rules that Congo Pictures cease advertising the film as authentic, and RKO drops the film from all of its theaters. But that's not the end because Billy C is all. Screw RKO. We're rich now, baby. We don't even need studio-owned movie theaters anymore. We'll just book it in independent movie theaters as the film the government doesn't want you to see. Yeah. And it worked. Soon it's in 30 cities all across America. Uh, twice as many as it was when it was just an RKO film. And it's making bank. And this pisses off William Hayes with the the Hayes uh, office, the Hayes Code. And that petty, that petty bitch. Oh, no, she did it. This <laughs> is what she did. She tracks down our boy, Charlie. The guy with the gorilla suit. And they strong arm him. To come out as the principal ape in the ape suit in Ngagi. They literally Aww. got Charlie the Filipino and blackmailed him. Hey, uh, th we're the Hayes Commission. If you don't come out and say, hey, Ngagi is fake and I was in a gorilla outfit, then we will make sure that you never work in Hollywood again. And so 
they outed Charlie, the guy with the suit. And he came out and he's like, yeah, Ngagi's fake. I was in the grill outfit. But that didn't hurt Ngagi at all. And they advertised that this was a banned film. Uh, and it went on to make millions. In fact, it was such a smash hit that... Uh, Bunny, are you still there? Yeah. Yes? Okay, I just... I, I clicked something. Oh, no, I can't see you at all. Okay, there you go. Okay. Uh, this film is such a smash hit that a year later in 1931, the whole gang gets back together and films a second fake documentary called New Ma Poo Cannibalism. Okay. But uh, it was not a hit. Now, that film is lost. If you look up Ngagi on YouTube, you will find some people and be like, Ngagi, the first found footage horror film. No, this isn't a found footage film at all. And uh, a lot of people say, oh, the long lost film, Ngagi, this was never lost. Now, the follow-up they did, New Ma Poo, Cannibalism, that is lost. I can't find crap about that film. Whereas in Goggy, uh, it never went away. It just became a obscure piece of film history, which is odd because if you could switch it to picture J, Bunny, literally three years after Congo Pictures makes in Goggy, literally RKO sees the $4 million that Ngagi made and said, now see, here's where their problem was. They tried to pass that flick off as real. What if we make Ngagi, but we don't pass it off as real. We let everyone know that it's fake there. That's like a 1930s. Hey, who took my shirts? <laughs> Uh, what I find what I find fascinating about this is that it's so backwards to how things ordinarily are. Ordinarily, there is a good movie, and then there is yeah. a cheap ripoff. Yeah, you know, like first there's Star Wars, then there's Battle Beyond the Planet. When I say ice pirates, people get pissed. Yeah. That is what I learned. Yeah. First there's Star Wars, then there's ice pirates. This is completely the, the other way around. First yeah. there's a crap movie, <gasps> and then there's a, a, a really, really good ripoff of that crap movie. Yeah. This is the opposite way. They got a crap movie, and they made a wonderful film out of it. But huh. that right there, that poster, King Kong. They just did Ngagi good. That's all they did. That's yeah. all they did. And I've been obsessed about this question for a long time because I always wondered what was so weird about Godzilla versus the sea monster. Yeah. Also known as uh, Ibira Horror of the Deep. Uh, is that they find Godzilla inside of a mountain and he awakens from his slumber and he falls in love with a beautiful native woman. And I thought, why in the world is this the one and only Godzilla film where Godzilla is horny for a human woman? And then I learned, oh, wait, they were going to make this as a King Kong film, but they didn't want to do a King Kong film just then. So they just said, Fuck it, just put Godzilla in it. Oh, so that makes me think, why the hell is G King Kong wanting to do it with the mom from Growing Pains? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And now we know it's because RKO literally just said, let's copy and Gagi. And, uh, well, won't people know we're copying Ngagi? No, we'll do a sound alike. How about this? 
instead of making our apes like 12 feet tall, we'll make them 100 feet tall. There you go. It's legally different. Trust me. No one will know. And RKO <laughs> was right because here we are right now in the year of our Lord 2023. And people love King Kong and they have no idea that King Kong's daddy was the world's first mockumentary that was super racist. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That is insane. That really is it, insane. It's on a lot of crazy. Levels. Dude, now, like, like from, from going from going from never having heard of it to totally seeing it. You yeah. know, like it's obvious. Yeah. And every 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 single solitary itineration of King Kong has been based on this movie that no one knows about. Which is weird because it was a huge, massive runaway hit for its time, but King Kong was a little bit more. Yeah. And history is written by the winners. That's right. Yeah. So, okay, that was a long half, but geez, that is a story, and I freaking love that. Now, I want to mention one thing about Ngagi, and then I'm going to go into some interesting postscripts for our cast of characters. Okay. Which is going to be a lot of fun. But first off, number one, the first thing I want to mention. Ngagi is out there. You can see it right now if you want it. It was released on Blu-ray in 2021. It got like a 4K Blu-ray rest <clears throat> restoration with, um, I think, from Kino Pictures. Kino releases. It's got uh, uh, commentaries and... It, it's really amazing. And then you can download it on archive.org. It's all over YouTube in varying degrees of quality. If you really want a pristine copy of Ngagi, get the Blu-ray. But word of warning, and I can't stress this enough. I, 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 I saw this somewhere. I read a lot of articles and uh, about this film, and then I tracked down the film, and then I saw the film. I saw Ngagi. For this podcast segment, and um, <clears throat> some article somewhere, some movie reviewer said that people will no doubt flock to this film expecting a so bad it's good laugh riot like Reefer Madness. This movie sucks. Oh, yeah. Huh? It is so bad. It is not good. Imagine a less good, much longer reefer madness, which is shocking because that's not good to begin with. But compared to Ngagi, reefer madness is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Yeah. But um, it's boring AF. Uh, the stock footage and scenes from other movies is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> suggested bestiality plus there's a lot of real life uh, animals being slaughtered in it so I saw it for the segment it's not for the faint of heart or the easily bored or the ADHD it's, it's not a so bad it's good film it's just bad but if you want to see uh, King Kong's Daddy, it's on YouTube. It's just there. So you can see it whenever. You it's are weird. saying what I am hearing you say is Don't that this movie would have been greatly improved with a sock puppet. Yes. Okay. Yes. It would have been greatly improved with a sock puppet. Yes. And uh, it's not even good. It's not even a good movie while you're high. It's not even. If that, you're gonna see a, 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 a gorilla costume movie, just see APE, not to be confused with King Kong. It stars Joanna Kearns. Yes. So, uh, let's do some postscripts for our cast of characters. Pretend this is a movie made by uh, uh, the Karazuskis. Scott Alexander and Larry Karazuski. 
they did Ed Wood and it had all the post scripts at the end. Yes. And then there, the next script they wrote was the people versus Larry Flint. And I'm watching the movie going, I wonder if it's going to have a uh, cheesy post scripts like Ed Wood. And then it does. Yeah. Uh, so here's some interesting post scripts for some of the characters. Billy C, the director, he made a ton of movies before in Kagi. He was a carny. He he ran away to join the circus. He was a carny. He opened his own movie theater. He started writing scripts uh, for the guy who invented are we, are Hollywood. Are we flipping frames? Huh? Did we flip frames or were we? No, not yet. To... Not right, yet. I don't right. have a I don't have a picture for each one of these post scripts. But uh, Billy C, the director, he's the mousy guy. Uh. <coughs> He made a bunch of movies, mostly animal comedies, and then he did Ngagi, and then he did New Mapu Cannibalism, and after the failure of New Mapu Cannibalism, he would never make another film, but he lived off of his millions and lived a long, quiet life, and he died in the 70s at age 87. It astounds me, some people who live so long like, my grandfather died in uh, 2000 and right at the beginning of 2010. My grandfather died in 2010, and he was 98 years old. Yeah. So, like, he was so old to think that, like, a few weeks before he died, he was on, like, a Zoom call. Oh, wow. You know, and to think like he would hop the rails. He was an actual cowboy who was hired to protect a ranch. So it blows my mind that the director of a 1930s film lived to see Billy Jack. Yeah. You know, that's weird. That like the director of the film that King Kong was based on. <clears throat> Live to see Saturday Night Live. <clears throat> That's weird. So good for Billy C, the director. He lived a long life with a bunch of money. Then there's Willie, the maybe or maybe not teenage money man movie producer. Now I'll switch it to Picture K. And that's the uh, good looking dude in the suit. Reminds yeah. me of uh, the trumpeter in the movie Babylon, which is now out on streaming. And I suggest you watch it. But FYI, it's filthy as hell. Yeah, it is such a dirty film. But it's a great look at like this in Gaggy <clears throat> moment in American Hollywood. During World War Two, Willie worked with the U.S. government making uh, newsreels for black audiences back in America. He made films for the U.S. government about black life for black people in World War II in order to lift up spirits for the people who were at home. When, he, when the war was over, he opened his own production studio and made movies before moving to London, where he became a highly praised filmmaker who was known for making a series of documentaries about Africa. So a fake documentary led to a number of real documentaries, and in fact, in the year 1960, ABC aired a 12-part documentary by him really? on primetime. Yeah, about the uh, African countries that were popping up. He stayed a movie producer throughout his entire life in the 1970s. He produced O.J. Simpson's first starring film. Oh, my God. Starring Ooh. film. He died in the Bronx in 1991. Dude, you saw Michael Keaton's Batman. That's astounding. Good for you, Willie, the teenage movie producer. Then uh, our next postscript is Charlie the Filipino with the gorilla suit. He would become a celebrated Hollywood makeup artist. 
he would continue to be the gorilla in a number of films, but he also moved towards makeup and uh, being a makeup artist. In fact, uh, I've got a picture of him. Can you switch it to picture L, please, Bonnie? Because that is the Charlie with the suit. He nice. was the creator who created the alien creatures and is in the rubber outfit for freaking I married a monster from outer space. Nice. That's Charlie the Filipino in there. Isn't that crazy? He made, he came up with the design for the alien and he made the suit and he's in the freaking suit. He went from nice. in Goggy to uh, I married a monster from outer space. He did a bunch of work, but despite his long and celebrated Hollywood career, uh, he died actually in like, I think the 60s or 70s making a film. I think Jack the Giant Slayer or Jack and the Giant, Kill Jack the Giant Killer. I don't know, but he died like, while making a film. But despite his long and celebrated Hollywood career, he is still known to this day as, quote, the king of the gorilla man. Okay. Now, I want to go back to Ngagi, the picture itself, for a little bit, because here's the historic part. So they tried to make a sequel called New Mapu Cannibalism, but it failed. Then, like in the 50s, somebody else made a movie and then stole a bunch of scenes from Ngagi, which was funny because it's stealing a, a scenes from a movie that stole things. But anyway, in, the in 1940, a black actor and writer named Spencer Williams wrote a short story about these half ape, half human hybrids who are attacking people. He called the story House of Horror, and he sold it as a screenplay, but the producers wanted a snappier title. So just like Troll 2, it would be called, and can you switch it to Picture M, Bunny? House of Horror would be called Son of Ngagi. This was a movie that came out in 1940 that was named this solely to make you, the audience, think that it's a sequel to Ngagi when it's not. Again, it's freaking Troll 2. And I like the fact that this is the original movie poster for Ngagi, and yet uh, some website decided that they were going to copyright it, and I realized that like this morning. So it says on the bottom, like, copyright, something like that. But you didn't make the Son of Ngagi poster. Oh. So, uh, it's fine. So, uh, I bring Son of Ngagi up because it is historic. It's got an all-black cast, a black screenwriter who wrote the script based on a black uh, a man's short story this is some people call son of ngagi the first all black horror movie other people call son of ngagi the first all black science fiction movie either way ngagi spawned a historic sequel which is also on youtube and it sucks i tried watching it and i just I, even though it's got the four toppers. Yeah. I I could not watch this. But it's the first uh, black horror movie. It's the first black science fiction movie. You can draw a line between Son of Ngagi and, I don't know, Nope. Oh, it was a, I love that movie. Okay. <laughs> and I really like Us. I really like Us a lot. Yeah. And I think a large portion of that has to do with the fact that I used to live in Sacramento and I would I spent a lot of time at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. So here is a horror movie that is takes place somewhere I've been. Yeah. You know? So the last postscript, and then we will be done with this, is Selig the Conjurer. The carny looking for his next big gimmick. The guy with the strange-ass zoo. The fake colonel. The man who accidentally started Hollywood. Um, 
I've got a picture of him. Here, Bunny, can you put the last picture up, Bunny? Ta-da! That fake colonel. Carney, con man, looking for his next big score, would be known as one of Hollywood's founding fathers, and you can pay tribute to this strange ma- ass man by visiting his star on the Hollywood Walk of Freaking Fame. That's selling the conjurer star. Fail upwards. Fail freaking upwards. So go and visit Selig the Conjurer. He's at 6116 Hollywood Boulevard. He's near Rock Hudson Star and also a fairly decent Subway restaurant. <laughs> William Selig, he got a freaking star. He got a freaking <coughs> star by screwing over <coughs> Thomas Edison. So that is the story. The true story of the first mockumentary. I am wildly proud of this. Of this. I'm sorry that it was so long, Bunny. Yeah. I talked myself uh, sober from that uh, uh, pre roll that I did before the show, but uh, what a great story, huh? Yes, but just a small aside as it pops in my head. I mean, like, but that's kind of, kind of. The founding of Hollywood altogether. I mean, Hollywood is on the other coast in a lot of reasons to avoid patent infringement suits. Yep. Yeah. There was something with the projectors as well that was that was a stolen patent. Yep. But this guy screwed over Thomas Edison, and because of that, you saw Top Gun Maverick. And back in the day, it wasn't that easy getting to California to sue somebody. Yeah. Yeah, Top so Gun go, Maverick. Did we fucking need that? So go and visit <sighs> William Selig's star. Then after that, say hi to Rock Hudson. Give him my phone number. And then head on over to the subway and get a foot-long uh, meatball sub. And this is what I have done literally in the past they ask, would you like anything else? And I say, yes, some mayonnaise. And they said, mayonnaise. Okay, how much? And I say, keep on putting it in there until you say, oh my God, this is way too much. That's when you stop. Oh. I can a shoot, meatball? Some? I can shoot meatballs out of my butt like a Nerf gun. Yeah, I would I would imagine. <laughs> so this has been a great historic approximation. Yes, it has. That was fun, wasn't it? Yes. I, All right. So. I am going to have to mm-hmm. see these movies for their historical importance. And 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 it, and I am so big into King Kong, I cannot not see at least in Gagi, but yep. the historical significance of Son of Gagi. I might have to watch that too. And and this is what I think should be the new logo for our podcast. It's a tortadillo drawn to look like a Pokemon. I'll get. Some of my kids working on that. Being carried up into outer space by by a flying saucer. That's 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 it right there. Boom. That's the money shot. Nailed it. Uh. Uh. So, I'll get I'll get to work on that, bunny. I'll get to work on our new logo. In my mind, it's beautiful. Uh. So that's it for Historic Approximations this week. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Be sure and join us next time for more educationally uneducational fun with Historic Approximations, or as I like to call it, and cut on that.